Welcome to Cultural Capital. I'm Nancy Durrant and I'm the arts editor of the Evening Standard. Coming up, we try to find out what it means to be happy at the Welcome Collection. We talk to the Tottenham community activist Stafford Scott and his daughter Kamara, who've curated a new exhibition at the ICA. We're peeking through a keyhole at the Wallace Collection for Thing of the Week. And I'll be reviewing an incredible music documentary stuffed with unseen footage from one of the most epic music festivals ever held. But first, how are you feeling? Would you say you're happy? Just contented? Are you bursting with joy? Or would you feel better for half an hour in a darkened room? We headed to the Welcome Collection's new pair of exhibitions to ponder these questions and more. Our season on happiness brings together free exhibitions and events that set out to explore how we feel good. Um, what is the value of positive emotions in difficult times? How do they help us navigate adversity and emotions such as joy, for example? Um, and we're looking at happiness not as a fixed state. We're looking to break it down in, and, and explore all of the different feelings that sit under this vast concept. So we're bringing together different perspectives from culture to science and religion that will kind of seek to explore some of the factors that, that shape how we feel and, and look at the ways in which our emotions impact upon our health. So the exhibition Tranquility looks at the calmer positive emotional states and it's connected to feelings like serenity, peace and balance. The exhibition presents newly commissioned artworks um, by the artists Jasmine Kaur and Crystal Labasse and the exhibition brings together contemporary artworks and historic artefacts which explore different ways in which individuals have sought moments of tranquility. From seeking solitude to being outside, from meditation and keeping a diary, these are some of the different techniques individuals have used throughout the centuries to help them uh, achieve a sense of balance and cope with life's distractions. Joy is at the other end of the emotional spectrum. It's a more excited state. It can be intense and fleeting and leave you wanting more. The exhibition brings together newly commissioned artworks by the artists Harold Ofei, David Trigley and Amalia Pika, which all consider different routes to, to, to finding joy through experiences such as dancing together, participating in a protest, sharing a meal and laughing. We look at the different ways in which Joy can be contagious, it's, it's connected to social experiences, but also how joy can help us navigate difficult experiences and cope with adversity. Interspersed through both exhibitions and across the season, we bring together different perspectives from artists, poets, writers, neuroscientists, religious leaders, psychologists, to all consider the different ingredients that shape how we feel good. The On Happiness season runs at the Welcome Collection until February 2022. Now for another exhibition of a very different kind. War in a Babylon, the community struggle for truth and rights aims to shine a light on collective actions, resistance and grassroots activism undertaken by black communities across the UK in response to racism. We talked to the curators to find out more. Babylon is a system that doesn't give people justice. Babylon is a system that oppresses groups, especially minority groups. The war is our battle for justice, which we've been denied. So the war is about our trying to bring our story, telling our truths and rights to the rest of the people. As a child, I used to walk the street and people used to call me all kinds of racist names. We don't have to do that no more. That direct interpersonal racism, we don't see that so much anymore. What we have is institutional and institutionalised racism. So we're no longer talking about institutional, which happens occasionally. We're talking about institutionalised, which is embedded from the highest institution in the land, which is government, all the way through. So it's critical and important that any right and fair-minded person comes and judges a community experience and judges for themselves. I think most white people, I think most ordinary people know 
the institutional racism is an everyday English reality. Institutional racism, how does it affect generations of black people? It holds us back. And I think the main thing that we're seeing now is that it's intergenerational and that it is hard to move past it when we are being raised by people who are so heavily impacted by it. The impact of the racism of yesteryear is here, very much here with us today. Our ability, or some people's ability, inability to engage, to be a part of the society, um, to provide leadership to their children comes from being traumatised, damaged and violated as children by a brutal, hostile, oppressive system. I think there's a lack of understanding of what black British people go through. I think last year we saw how much people are readily able to focus on black Americans. I don't think it's intentional, but I think there's a lack of access to information and, and there's a general kind of narrative that British racism is covert. Lockdown has obviously meant that um, as a community we've not been able to engage. There's lots of um, energy we want to build into that and it's not just about coming out of lockdown it's that we're coming up to the 10th anniversary of the police killing of Mark Duggan and also the 10th anniversary of the riots that ensued so there's a lot of energy in the air and we think that we can um, gather that energy garner that energy bring that energy together and use it in a positive way to make positive noise and hopefully it will resonate and reverberate around the rest of London. live in the same city. We're all part of one community, ultimately. And if we understand each other better, then maybe we might be able to get on better in the future. The exhibition is at the ICA on the Mall until the 26th of September. Do you feel like a thing of the week? Here it is. I'm standing next to a painting by Antoine Watteau called Voulez-vous triompher des belles? Watteau is a painter who was responsible for the creation of a genre that we now today call the Fête Galante. He is an artist who's represented in collections like the Musée du Louvre, the um, Sans Souci in Potsdam, but the Wallace is really unique in having these three wonderful works by him on panel. This is a work uh, that represents his interest in the Commedia dell'arte, Italian theater. Um, and so you see that there is a figure who's dressed as Harlequin. We, re we recognize him because of his lozenged suit. Um, and he's next to his lover, Columbine. It's a painting that's very special because it was one of the few Vateaux that was inherited by Richard Wallace, the last founder um, of the collection. Richard Wallace sent it to an exhibition in 1860 in Paris that was responsible for the revival of the Fête Galante. Okay, did you know Stevie Wonder could play the drums? Because I did not know that Stevie Wonder could play the drums. And I would likely never have found out that Stevie Wonder could play the drums if it weren't for the musician, writer and director Amir Thompson, AKA Questlove, unearthing the footage that makes up this amazing documentary from a basement in Harlem after more than 50 years. Are you really ready? Are you ready to listen to all the beautiful black voices, the beautiful black feeling, the beautiful black waves moving in beautiful air? Are you ready, black people? Are you ready? 1969 is a famous year for a number of reasons. Man first set foot on the moon, the Beatles gave their last public performance, and the Woodstock Festival announced flower power to a wide-eyed, wider public. But that summer, there was another festival taking place in the heart of New York City. The Harlem Cultural Festival ran over nine consecutive weekends in Mount Morris Park. The knockout roster of artists included B.B. King, Nina Simone, Mahalia Jackson, Sly and the Family Stone, and yes, a 19-year-old Stevie Wonder. 300,000 mostly black Americans flocked to be there. They were powerfully addressed by the Reverend Jesse Jackson, they sang along with some of the biggest hits of the era, and the whole incredible event was filmed from start to finish in glorious colour. And then the footage was stashed in a basement and never seen again, until now. 
Forget the year that Beyonce played Glastonbury. This lineup is truly the stuff of dreams. But this is so much more than just a really epic concert film. Questlove has taken pains to put the event in context with newsreel footage and new interviews with attendees and artists who played, including members of the Edwin Hawkins Singers, Gladys Knight, who was 25 at the time and apparently stopped ageing, age 50, and a four-piece called The Fifth Dimension, whose mashup of Aquarius from the musical Hair and Let the Sunshine In was the second biggest hit that year. Their emotion at seeing the footage for the first time is incredibly moving. You hear the views of attendees who were interviewed at the time about the moon landings. Mostly, they think the money could have been better spent helping the needy at home. And you see the fervour of the Reverend Jackson, who just a year before had been a hair's breadth from his friend Martin Luther King when he was gunned down in Memphis. Questlove talks to members of the Black Panthers too, who had provided additional security. And you start to wonder how easy it would be now for 300,000 mostly black people to gather together over nine weekends and be left to get on with it in peace in our own city, in our own era, let alone late 60s America. It is so powerful and at the same time so joyful and it's in cinemas now. Thanks so much for watching Cultural Capital. Give us a like, subscribe, comment and we'll be back next week.